All right. I'm Rin. I'm Scott. We are the hosts of Geek Knives. It is a podcast about gaming. We've been doing this for 13 years. No. This is our 44th PAX panel. This no. is our like 390th panel at yeah. other conventions, not just PAXs. I'm old, put me in the grave now. Yup. <laughs> and we're here today to not only teach you how to play Carcassonne, but to make sure you're playing the game right, and then we're gonna make you all monsters. Yeah, and make the monsters fight each other. So, ostensibly, <laughs> when you play a game, like a board game, you're here, like you're trying to win, right? Like you're playing these games, and you're, ostensibly your goals are to have fun and win. And you might prioritize one over the other, and you can usually tell depending on whether someone plays like Tigger's New Freddy's or Munchkin. But, uh, <laughs> are you really? trying to win. Right, and how much are you trying to win? Are you putting your full mind, body, and effort into nothing but winning? Or are you just sort of like, kind of trying to win, but also thinking about something, and also eating a drumstick? You know? Yep, checks down your phone. You don't quite understand that complicated scoring <coughs> that happens at the end, so you're not worrying about it. You're just doing the parts of the game you know, and sort of ignoring that other thing because it's too much work. So, I gotta give you some real fair warning, and if you watch our YouTube video on how to win at games, it's even worse. If you do the things that we're talking about and you really seriously try to win tabletop games, you're going to make tabletop games a lot less fun. Right, so a small example is Settlers, right? In Settlers, what's the fun part of Settlers? Trading! I'll give you one sheep, two wood, hey, hey, hey. I right? got some wood for your sheep. Right. The fact is, if you want to win at Settlers, you almost never trade ever with you anybody. Only, you under only any trade if you're ripping someone off. And if everyone at the table is smart, you can't rip anyone off. No one ever trades, and there's more they rarely, we'll rarely trade. Right, so learning how to win a game, so you play with people who are trying to win and know the best way to win, the fun quality goes way down. And you'll also find that a lot of people don't want to play games with you if you're trying to win. Lots of bad yeah. things will happen. Yeah. And that, that video goes into in depth. We won't get into it here. <coughs> but we're going to go a little step further because the real problem is that Carcassonne is a great game. I really like it. It was one of my first like real board games that I got into. But base Carcassonne, not a lot of strategic depth once you start. Like You can all play it optimally by the end of this event here. Or at least oh, nearly yeah. optimally. Yeah, they look smart. I mean, we might be able to make an AI that'll win 1% more often than you, but if you do the things we're talking about, you're all gonna win a much higher percentage of the time than you normally well, would. Actually, only one-fifth of you will win, because it's a five-player game. <laughs> <laughs> so, we gotta really briefly talk about the word game. What, like, what does it mean to win a game? And the reason for this is that gamers, what do we love to do more than anything else is argue about the rules and some arbitrary semantics. <laughs> so, the word game, we're going to use the word ortho game instead. That is a word coined by Richard Garfield, who you may know from such hits as Magic the Gathering. And he defined an ortho game as opposed to just a game, like a tag or a patty keg or a pheasant that I'm gonna to cook tonight for dinner, as a competition between two or more players with an agreed upon set of rules and a method of ranking said players. Someone is the highest ranked. Right, and this is why Carcassonne is definitely an ortho game. It's a competition, there's two or more players, we agree on the rules, after we're done telling you them, we'll agree on them, we don't agree on them yet. Uh, and there's definitely a method of ranking. Who has the most points? That is the winner. So your only concern today is to be the highest ranked player. Now, if we structure the tournament, because there's a lot of people a little bit differently, like top two advance, you literally do not care if you are ranked number two or number one. You just do not want to be ranked number three or lower. Think about that very carefully. What is the real win condition? How are players being ranked, and how do you game that system to get the benefit? A good example of this is we went to school at the Rochester Institute of Technology. And I, saw, I saw an RIT uh, sweatshirt in the uh, hallway. So we were in the anime club for like five years, and we... <laughs> yeah, what's up? All right. So, RIT is peculiar in that there are not pluses and minuses in your grades. That changed. Oh, they uh, ruined everything. So when we were there... The quarter system. You see how old we are? So when we were there, a B plus and 89% had the same effect on your life as an 80%. Meaning, if you weren't going to get an A in a class, you shot for that low B. Because it was the same as a high B. A high B meant you could have played more Counter-Strike. The other thing is, like, if you got, if you got C's, you got the same diploma as someone with B's, and your employer's never gonna know or care about that, right? When's the last time anyone asked for my transcript? <laughs> never. Actually, you know what? This got ruined, because I got a new job, and they wanted my RIT transcript. Well, I guess if you want to work at a big fancy company over here... But if you want to make almost the same amount of money, <laughs> and not have to go through all that... Yeah, anyway. So, another really important thing, and this is also heuristics, 
The best way to describe this without getting too deep into it is that a heuristic is the rules that a human uses to figure out what to do without calculating anything. And the best example of this is something called the gaze heuristic. Because the reality is, I can take some object here, and I can Don't just- Don't throw that! And I could just wing it out there- Don't! At one of you. Do not. And the odds are, you can catch it. If someone throws an object to you, you can catch it usually if you want to. But how do you catch it? It's not like you're looking at it saying, aha, it is accelerating at this rate and it will reach its peak this many meters away from me and therefore it will let, you're not doing this calculus while the thing is flying and then it lands on the ground. That doesn't happen. Somehow you're able to catch it every time without any conscious thought or math whatsoever. And it's even more complicated than that because if I throw an object at you, no one else here can actually predict who I threw it to until they catch it. You can only predict that you could catch it if it's coming to you. And the reason is, we don't do differential calculus in our heads. We instinctually look up at an object that is following a ballistic trajectory, and we lock our neck at the angle that causes us to continue to be looking at it. We then move forward and backward to make sure that that angle remains constant. And if you do that, the, and you don't bump into a table, the object will guaranteedly hit you right in the face. So then you step back a little bit and you catch it. <laughs> it's a simple rule that is not a full <laughs> simulation of the world, but it's good enough to give you a better result than chance. Board games can be analyzed with maths. Simple board games can be analyzed by humans at the table with maths. We've played games where we can do a little bit of math and know exactly what to do and the game is stupid. And this is why a computer will often beat you even if you're really good at a game because they're doing the full math calculating exactly where that ball is gonna land. Right? But your heuristic is a little bit fuzzy, but it's good enough to beat other people because they're not computers, hopefully. No cyborgs here, right? No? No? Terminator. Yeah, that's not allowed. That's an augmentation. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess, I mean, I, I'm slightly enhanced. I mean, uh, yeah, but no one's got a brain chip, right? You're yeah. not, no one's the guy. <laughs> right? We're gonna check everyone for, uh, for like, performance enhancing drugs or something? I think we do. Yeah? Okay. So, in characteristics of games, which if you're here, you're probably not just interested in playing games, but also game design. <coughs> characteristics of games, by Richard Garfield Great. and some other people. Grim's favorite book in the world. Is the best like 101 primer to the reality of game design. It's a boring Earth. textbook. Yeah, but if you're interested in this stuff, one of the concepts it talks about is that in games, it's useful to break out two different kinds of heuristics. A, a directional heuristic is how you decide, based on what you know about a game, to do next. So a heuristic I might use in Shadowgate is when confronted with two dodgy looking things, I'll use the less dodgy looking one. It's not perfect. There is a reason and a way to go up this way, but that is a better rule than flipping a coin. Right, you're playing a game, you have to make decisions, right? It's like, well, I need a method for how am I going to decide? And you play Carcassonne on your directional hair stick, you're gonna need some method by which you decide where to put the tile. Yep, should I put a guy on the tile? Where right. do I put that How guy? do you decide whether you put a meeple on it or not, and then how do you decide where to put the meeple, right? You're gonna need some sort of, you know, thing that tells you, the, you know, what method are you gonna use to make those decisions, just based on gut instinct? Or, no, that's not a way to win gut instinct, right? Now, you'll know you've developed a very powerful set of heuristics when you're playing games when you instinctually make good decisions <laughs> and you don't even necessarily understand why at first. That is a fully evolved heuristic. And that other talk gets into it more. Positional heuristics is how you determine, based on what you know, how the players are currently ranked, who is winning. And as you know, this is not as simple as who's in first place at any given time. All right, as per the Mario Kart, right? So this is important, the positional heuristic of knowing who's in first, knowing who's in last, because that is one of the inputs into your directional heuristic, right? Where you put that tile depends on who's in first, who's in last. Whether you put a meeple or not, well, I would have put a meeple if Rim was in first, but because he's not in first, I won't put the meeple. Now, some of you might be saying, but that's an arbitrary distinction, like they're both kind of the same thing. That is a ridiculously pedantic and pointless argument. That's why I had that definition of game before. All right. Same kind of thing. But a level one heuristic in Mario Kart would be whoever's in first. A level two heuristic might be whoever's in second is actually in first if there's enough time left for a blue shell to come. And it gets more and more complex from there. And to show this complexity, this is a uh, page from that characteristics of games book. Who is in first place in this game right now? Who's winning, A or B? Mm -hmm. The answer to that question is really complicated and really interesting, and that is why heuristics are important. 
So now we're going to talk about Carcassonne specifically. Alright, so Carcassonne is a game, I guess the theme of this game, sorry if we don't care about theme, for people who care about theme. Uh, I'm not sorry, we don't care about theme, look, it's talking about monks and followers and thieves and farmers. No, they are meeples, they are going on tiles, there are things you put them on, you are scoring points. The fiction does not matter, you're here to win. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but yeah, here's how this game works. In the base set, there's going to be some number of land tiles. We don't know if our instruction manual matches those boxes. I believe it is still 72 tiles. Okay, there are 72 tiles. There is one of them that is dark on the back. That is the start tile. It will be face up in the middle of the table, right? All the other ones are light gray on the back. You shuffle them up. The tiles look kind of like this. They'll have things like cloisters. We're going to go through the terminology. There are cloisters. They look like a little house that's not connected to anything except like a road. Yeah, if they're on the tile, there won't be anything else on the tile except maybe a little road. There are city segments. You can see that they're a big city that touches at least one edge. Mm -hmm. There are roads. If there's any schmutz on a road, that blocks it. And anything else on a tile is <coughs> garbage flavor text you can ignore, or it's something for an expansion that you're not playing with and you can ignore. Right, one thing that happens in Carcassonne a lot is there's so many expansions that try to milk people from their money, and most of those expansions are complete trash. Like the catapult where you freaking get meeples in there, wink, that's fun, but it's not good, don't buy it. Uh, so, but the thing is, if you buy expansions, almost all of them come with more tiles. Right? And what you can do is you can just play with those tiles, add them to your Carcassonne, don't change the rules, don't use the expansion rules, just get more tiles. Your game will be longer, it will last longer, the game will actually be more skill-based when you have more tiles, less randomness, right? And maybe more fun based on, you know, whether you like that or not. Yep. So, to actually play the game, that first tile will be out there. We'll arbitrarily pick a starting player. Uh, I recommend an app called Chwazi, C-H-W-A-Z-I, for choosing your star players in any game. Yep. Unless and the game says otherwise. What you will do is draw a tile, one of these tiles, you will look at it, and then you will present it to all the other players. The rules are very clear about this. You must present it to everyone so that they may advise you as to what to do with that tile. I highly recommend you do not listen to what anyone says <laughs> well, about what to do with these tiles. There may be times where you might take someone's advice, but, you know, think about who you're listening to. But they have the right to give you that advice. You cannot hide the tile from them while you think. Right. Also, definitely give people advice. Don't just there, sit there quietly. Put it, put it there, 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 put it there. Give it there. people advice in a way that might convince them to do something more beneficial for you. <laughs> <coughs> so then you must place that tile somewhere where it lines up with whatever is on the other tile right. that is touching. Road's got to touch a road, grass got to touch a grass, castle got to touch a castle. Can't do that. Can't have a road going into a castle edge. Yep. It's pretty straightforward. And then you may, if you wish, take one of your meeples. Your if you guy, have a meeple. Yep. Your little dudes, if you have one. Gender neutral, they're just meeples. And you may place it on one of the features of the tile. That is your entire turn. And then the next player will do the same. And the next player will do the same. And you'll keep going until the last tile is placed, you do some final scoring, and the game is over. And whoever has the most points wins. Look how easy that game is. Yeah, and it actually is pretty straightforward. Once you place a tile, the places you can put a tile, if there is a city segment, you can place it on that city. If there is a road, you could place it on that road. So this tile, I could go on the city or the road. You can also put them in the farm, in the grass. You lay them down on the side and you stick them in the grass. Right, we put them on down on the side so there's no confusion as to where that meeple actually is. Also because farmer tiles who are laying down never come back up. They're there for the whole rest of the game. So that's why we lay them flat. And note that the road separates the farm. <coughs> so both of these places are legitimate places to put a meeple. And a cloister, that house we talked about, you can put a guy just on the cloister. And it does a thing. Now note on this tile, you could just put it <coughs> in the grass around the cloister. Mm -hmm. Any feature that we have named, you can put a meeple on. And if we haven't given you a name for that feature, you cannot put a meeple on it. Another rule, if there is a meeple of any color, <laughs> not just yours, and it is in the contiguous feature created by a set of tiles, you cannot put a meeple in it with the tile. Right, so the tile on the left is already part of the board. 
right? The tile on the right is the tile you drew and you're adding to the board. So you made that city bigger by adding to it with your little tile there, right? You can't put your guy in there. There's already a red guy. meeple in that city. You cannot put another meeple into that city. Not allowed. But you could put it on the tile, just put it on a different feature. Sure, you could do that. That rule is messed up often enough to where there was a very long Reddit thread of someone who realized they've been playing Carcassonne wrong for like three years. <laughs> so don't do that. So, you can place meeples such that later they get connected. And we'll talk about that in a minute. That's like, if you, that's how you know that you uh, become a monster, right? If you start to get that stuff going. Okay. So the point of this game is to get points. And that might seem like a dumb thing to say. There are a lot of games where points are not the way you win. Right. Now, a lot of people, when a game is all about points, they think, aha, the way to win is to get as uh, many points as possible. That is not true. You just need to get more points than everyone else, right? It doesn't matter if you got 100 and the second place has 99. You can win with 25 to 24. Good enough, right? Remember, remember that definition. Just Orto get game. more points than the other players. Don't try to just get maximum points. I mean, that's often the way to get more points than the other players, but not always. So during the game, remember those features we talked about, the cities and everything? If you complete them, meaning that they are finished, they're blocked off, I think I have a slide with an example of that, yes. yes. Then roads are worth one point per tile, cities are worth two <coughs> points per tile, and two points per pennant, which we'll talk about, and cloisters are worth one point per adjacent tile. We'll show you exactly what those all look like. So roads, really simple. If I finish a road, meaning look, Every endpoint of the road terminates in something. There's no hanging endpoint anywhere. Right. That final bottom right piece here, finish the road. Right? It is worth four points because the road touches four tiles. Mm -hmm. Even though it touches this tile twice, that's now five points, that's four points. Now, there are four tiles of road. You own the road, it's finished, you get four points, you move up on the score track four spaces. Also, you remove your meeple. You take the meeple back into your supply. You have a limited number of meeples. Yep, now you can use that meeple again somewhere else. Cities, same deal. If the city is completely enclosed. The walls you, are all the way around that Carcassonne. Daddy, two points. You get two points for every tile in that city and you get two points for every one of these little pennant looking shield things. I don't know what they look like on those tiles, we're gonna have to see. There'll be a thing that's different that's on cities, it's just me, it comes like an extra like tile. Like a little flag or heraldry or something like that. So two, four, six points for the city, and then two more points for that for a total of eight points. Then you take the meeple back, because the city's done. Cloisters <coughs> score for every tile that is the tile you started on, one point, and any adjacent tile. Orthogonally adjacent or diagonally adjacent. So when you get that guy in the cloister, you want to just surround it in any way possible, right? And when if the ninth tile is placed and the whole thing is surrounded, you get all the points, and then you can remove the meeple. So far, every one of these things we score, roads, cities, cloisters, you get your meeples back when you score them. They're all real simple, the basic ways. So then you keep going until the game ends. The end game scoring, which if you haven't played a lot of these German style games, there's usually like regular scoring and then end of the game scoring. <laughs> the end of the game scoring is very similar. For every road that you have, that you control, that you have a meeple on, you have a dude on, you get one point per tile. <laughs> the same as if you'd finished it in the course of the game. You just don't get your meeple back because the game ended. So it's like, oh, you stranded your meeple, you didn't get to take them back, but hey, you still got the points, so you're good. Cities basically score at half points. You get one point per tile in the uncompleted city and one point per pennant in the uncompleted city. So if you want to complete the cities if you go into them, right? Yep. The road maybe you can have an unfinished road, but you really want to complete that city to get double your point. Cloisters score one point per adjacent tile that is there. So this one would score eight points. It's only missing this one up here for the nine. And the farmers. Remember the farmers, they laid out in the grass. You never get them back. People mess this up. You never get them back. Once they lay down in a farm, they are chilling in that farm until the end of the game. They might as well be dead. If you put all your meeples down in the farms, the rest of the game you're just putting tiles and doing nothing else. Now, like I said, there are a bunch of official standard ways to score this, and it literally depends on what year the box of Carcassonne you bought is from. We're teaching you the one that is used at most of the Carcassonne tournaments. Right. If the you, one that we don't like. If you like the one that we don't teach, 
you are my friend and I love you because I think you are correct, but we're not teaching that one because it's not the one people do. So the farms form contiguous areas based on all the grass that they touch. So if I have a guy here, all this grass is one All farm. this grass. Can be yours. Yes. What the heck? Except Europa. <laughs> Tracks of land all belong so to So this, this darker people here, that whole area is the farm. And the only thing you care about in a farm right. is Roads what, block farms, yep. cities block farms, but nothing else. It's grass, grass, grass. You get three points for every city that is in a farm or touching a farm that you control. If I have the most meeples in a farm and two cities, let's say I'm this guy, and one, two, three cities touch it that are completed. More. I don't know if that one's completed. I don't have to be complete. Oh, it's not completed. It they have be. to be completed cities. They can't be sort of it's half cities. It's cropped off the end there. Finnish cities are three points each if they touch your farm. Even little tiny cities. Now, for farms, just like with everything else, do I have a slide for it? Yeah, here's a, here's a more zoomed in example. So that's a farm, that's a farm, that's a farm. This one city is worth three points to blue from this farm, and three points to red from this farm at the end of the game. The same city could give multiple players points. <coughs> Another thing that can happen, you might be saying this whole time, because I mentioned whoever has the most meeples, but Rim and Scott, you can only put meeples on a place that doesn't already have a meeple. If I put a tile down, and I put a meeple on it, and other tiles get played, and eventually there's two areas that each have one meeple on them, and then a tile gets played that connects those two areas, that's totally okay. Right, so the blue meeple goes down, right? Imagine the bottom right tile with the cloister is not there yet, right? The blue meeple goes down, the yellow meeple goes down. They're both legal plays because they're not in the same farm yet. And then later on, someone adds that cloister in the bottom right, and now the farm of blue and the farm of yellow are connected, right? And now that's how you get two meeples into the same place. The same thing can happen with a city, it can happen with a road, it can happen with anything. But that's the only way to get multiple meeples into the same area is by putting them in separate areas and then adding tiles later to connect the two areas together. If you have the most meeples in a place, you get all the points. If you are tied, everyone in the tie gets all the points. Mm -hmm. That is very important. So blue and yellow here both get, uh, what? The points for the- Everyone thing. gets three points for that, because they're oh, all- every, Oh, red's red. in there too. Yeah, yeah, everyone's getting three. Everybody. All right. So again, <coughs> one point for road tile, two points for city tile that's finished, one point for closer tile when they finish. End of the game, one point for road, one point per city, one point for pennant, one point for closer tile, three points per city in a farm you control. All right, does anyone have any questions at this point? Anybody? <laughs> are we clear? We're it's good? a pretty simple game. Yeah, it's not that hard. It's a pass unplugged. You guys are pros. So let's talk about how to be good at this game. Maybe you can learn how to sweep the leg. Okay. So this gets brutal already. If you're at the table, Especially if you're playing with friends, but you're going to have to suss each other out based on social cues. If someone is doing poorly, take advantage of that. <laughs> More importantly, if someone's staring at one part, like you're taking your turn, and then turn, 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 and Scott's just staring at this one spot, really thinking. Odds are he's going to do something with that spot. That's the area he's concerned about. People are often very good at telegraphing what they intend to do in games. Carcassonne is very ripe for paying attention to that, noticing that. So look at people's faces, and also, don't look at where you're gonna do stuff. You'll look all around so no one can read you. If you draw a tile, and someone's like, and they like react a little bit, that tile is probably something they really needed. You definitely wanna make sure you do not put it in the place that they needed it to go. Don't always put a tile somewhere just because it like looks beautiful and that's fine. <laughs> so, Political, when we say Carcassonne is political, this is a very important concept for <coughs> games in general. Game theory politics is not normal politics. A political game basically means that players interact with each other in a way to where one player <coughs> could cause another player to win. The better way to put this is that all games that have more than two players and are not completely solitaire slash race style games are political. A good example of this we talked about before is Settlers of Catan. If I trade with Scott once, and Joey Jojo Shabadoo trades with Scott once, effectively Scott is at this sort of like plus one in the count of who's doing better at the game. Because interacting with another player in a trade is positive for both of you. 
This also means that if I am losing a game and I don't want Scott to win, I can just start doing things to hurt Scott because screw him and knock and make sure he doesn't win. There's really no way to avoid that in games, and Carcassonne is a political game. It's entirely possible that the best Carcassonne player in this room will not win the tournament, even if they try to, because somebody else in one game says, you know what, I'm going to lose, and I'm just going to spend all my tiles making sure they don't win, and then they don't win. Like when I made you draw all those yellow cubes on Thursday night? That's exactly what happened, <laughs> yes. And that other weird I didn't win. Actually, I did win that game, but I didn't think I was going to win. It's all right. All right, let's get to the brass tags. So... This is an alternate, there's a million expansions, and I want to bring this up as a really, ex like a holistic example of heuristics in this game. So in many expansions of Carcassonne, there's little meeples, and there's one big meeple. I checked those boxes. They do not have the big meeple. We're going to talk about the big meeple because we love the big meeple, but it has like this stupid thing called the Abbot, which I don't know what the hell that is. So I guess we're not going to play with it. Yeah, we could use the Abbot as Big Meeple. We'll get back to that. We but might anyway. use the Abbot as Big Meeple. The deal with the Big Meeple, if it's in a game of Carcassonne, is that it counts as two Meeples. Daddy two. It's otherwise just a Meeple, but it just counts as two when it's on the board. So on this board, Red is in the city with a small Meeple, and that city is worth a, a zillion points. That is a game-winning city right there. If, if that finishes, that. Red is just going to win. Green has their Big Meeple free and a regular Meeple free, and they drew this tile. What do they do? They can, they can put this tile here. Well, obviously, kill. you're not going to put it here, because that just gives Red a bunch of points. For nothing. Right? Why would you give someone else points? There is a tile? stupid expansion where you would want to do that. That's no, we're not playing. You don't want to do that. So we obviously, the move is to put it there and put a meeple on it, giving you a large chance of eventually having a tile go in the previous spot, thus connecting your green meeple to the city with the red meeple, and thus you and Red would both get points. Yep. So, the question is, do you put your big meeple here or your little meeple here? And it depends on your positional heuristic. I have a slide for this later, I forgot. If red sucks, and red is losing the game, if red is so far behind you that you don't think they could catch up, you might as well put your little meeple there. Because red wants to finish the city just as much as you do. You have doubled the chances the city will finish because two players are trying to find a tile that will connect this and complete the right. city. Right. In the game of Carcassonne, there were 70 something tiles. I have a whole slide for this. There are 72 tiles. And you're there only are... going to get to play 18 you're... if you have a four player game. Your I whole game, game will be playing 18 tiles. That's or the less. only 18 things you're going to do in the whole game. The rest of the game is completely out of your control. Right? Absolutely nothing to do with that rest of the game. If. You give Red an incentive to put a tile in that spot, you've just increased the chances of drawing that tile and getting it placed there by two. There's now 36 chances to have that tile put there because two players want it to happen, not one player. Conversely, if I put the big meeple there, Red definitely doesn't want to finish the city now because I'll get all the points, they'll get nothing. In fact, they are likely to try to sabotage my attempt to finish that city. So you really look at, is red a danger to you or not? If they are a danger, put the big meeple, roll tanks roll. If they're not a danger, put the little meeple, share the points with the loser because you literally don't care about them, they're losing. <laughs> so this is a general thing, but a lot of people <coughs> in tabletop games do not take their turn. Don't take a long time on your turn, because one- We don't if, have all day, it's packs, let's go. But two, if your turns are slow, that means that you're, you're spending a lot of time calculating, you're not building good heuristics, Forcing yourself to play faster will make you a better gamer. It'll make you better at games. But also, in Carcassonne, a lot of your decisions are arbitrary. It doesn't matter if you put the tile here or here or here. They're all functionally or mathematically the same. So think about that. If you feel like two things don't matter, don't agonize over it. Just put something, just play rock in rock, paper, scissors. It literally doesn't matter. Positional heuristics. Level one. The points. There's a point track. We're going to keep track of points when you score cities and roads and things along the time. So the basic positional heuristic, whoever's got the most points is in first place. But wait, that can't be right because you said it's only level one. There must be a level two. Level two. Likely farms. Who is setting up farms that are going to score at the end of the game? Because those are not reflected here. Those only show up at the end. Right, you might look here and be like, aha, I get to attack Red. Red has so many points. Meanwhile, on the board, there's like four green farmers that are worth like 20 each, right? And you're not accounting for that. And even though it looks like green is in last, no, green has a huge lead. You need to attack them. Let Red do whatever they want. They're actually in last. So claimed points on the score track plus potential farm points at the end of the game. And also potential other points from unfinished cities. Level three, 
What's really funny is that this rule book in this box we got doesn't seem to have the tile breakdown, but in regular Carcassonne, usually it shows you there are two of this tile, there are four of this tile, there's one of this tile. I'm not saying count tiles because you're gonna go insane, but pay attention to the tiles that there aren't a lot of. There is only one tile that looks like this. If a city needs that tile to finish, and that tile's already on the board, it ain't finishing. Mm -hmm. So you get to look at the board and get a rough sense of, of the cities that are on the board that are not completed. What are the odds that they're gonna complete? Does red have a whole bunch of cities that are like one tile away from scoring? Oh, yeah. look, look at that giant city with like three green meeples in it that's worth 40 points that's not reflected on the score track yet. Yup. Is it gonna finish? If it's gonna finish, I gotta give green like this many points to figure out if they're in first place or not. Oh, but it's not gonna finish, that tile's missing. Ah, green's only gonna get this many points for that at the end of the game, it's not that big a deal, I can beat them. So expanding mind-wise, the level four heuristic there is, remember we said you can like sneak into someone else's city by cleverly placing tiles and farms? You need to not just look at the farm someone's got, you need to look at, is <coughs> someone's positioned in such a way that they could connect into a big farm right at the end of the game? You gotta look at the points that are available for snatching and the likelihood that they will be snatched. There might that be is... a big empty farm that nobody's claimed yet that's worth like 20 points because there's a whole bunch of cities connected to it. Or Scott might be in that farm and I have two meeples in unlikely places and a path that I might be able to connect him into this farm before the end. With your 18 tiles. Yeah. yeah. Directional heuristics. What do you do? So one, maximize points per tile. Points per tile is the thing you need to think about. You play at most 18 tiles in this game. We're probably gonna group into groups of five, maybe you're gonna play even less tiles. Every tile you play has to get you points or a point equivalent, which we'll talk about in a minute. So think yeah. about that number. You'll see this big pile of tiles. <laughs> you don't have that much input. Don't start giant sprawling cities. They will never finish. Do things you can finish. Always have this number burned into your skull. At least have one road, one city, one cloister that you're working on at any given point. That and way if you, you draw a tile of that type, you got a place to put it that gets you a point. Right, if you draw a road tile and you don't already have a meeple on a road, there's your opportunity to start a road. That way if you draw another road tile, you've got a road to add it to, right? If you're only doing castles only and ignoring roads and whatever, then all these road tiles you draw, it's like, what are you going to do with them? You want to have meeples working on all the different areas, right, to score points in all the different areas, but because the tile draw is random, you want to be able to get points with whatever you happen to draw, because who knows what it's going to be. So here's the situation. What should red do? Here, red's got this road tile. Green and blue are in a game-winning monster city. If blue and green finish this city, it's probably game over for everyone else. So what should red do? Red, in this case, should actually be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> right? Red memorized all the tiles in the game. They know that the tile to finish that city is already played or does not exist. Even better, we'll talk about, I got slides about tile liberties. You'll see, this is going to start to get deep in a little bit. But I have reduced the liberties of finishing the city. I have made the city more difficult to finish. And even better, where does Red put their people? On that road. Don't put it on that road. That road ain't gonna finish. The road's no good. You're, that meeple's gonna be trapped on the road. If you got a ton oh, of meeples. Man, it looks a little late in the game. There's a lot of tiles there. If I got a ton of meeples, yeah, I'll stick it on the road. But maybe, I would probably stick it on this farm. It's always important. Because look, if I put it here, then it only takes me three tiles to connect that farm around here into that farm that looks like it loops around like big old farm down there. Maybe. So, I guess again, if someone sucks, if someone's losing, don't make fun of them, don't squeeze them, like don't, don't be a jerk outside of the game. Don't be a jerk in real life, but be a jerk in the game and steal their points. Share points with the people who cannot hurt you. This is why you need the positional heuristic. If someone's lower than you or not in first place, you want to share points with them to bring both of you up. It's, if it's a five player game and me and Rim share an enormous city with each other, guess what? We've just increases our chances of winning from 20% to two out of five. Right? Or 50%. There's only two of us left. Right? In a four-player game, you, if you've watched the Omegathons at other PAXs, oftentimes there'll be a situation where like, the last place player gets eliminated from the tournament or stuff like that. If all the players in a game but one collaborate on a city together, they have all increased their chances of winning because now Red definitely cannot win the game. Every one of these people has an increased chance of winning the game together. 
form a coalition with another player or two other players, uh, as long as it's not all the players in the game, because that's stupid, obviously, and you just eliminate this person. Attack only one, knock them out of the game, one less person to worry about. Right, now red. you don't want to form this coalition necessarily if blue is already kicking ass. You want to do this when red is kicking ass. That way it's like, oh, red, you thought you're so good? Guess what? Now you can't win. It's one of us three. We just increased our winning chance from 25% to 33%. Or, expanding mind style, you form one of these very early in a game with the person who you think is the least clever at the table. <laughs> king make. Make a king, but you're the vizier. Be opportunistic. Ooh, the app. The yeah. app is really good, by the way. Yeah, the app is really... If you got a tablet, I recommend. So, I drew this road tile, let's say, and I'm green, so I got this nice road going. I get to stick it on this road and keep it going. That's a nice road. But roads with one point, no matter where I put it, we're not playing with any weird rules. I should put it here and put a meeple on it, because there's already a stub of a road hanging out, so I'll get two points for placing this road if I put a meeple on it. Mm -hmm. The only reason I wouldn't do that is if I'm almost out of meeples. The other thing is it might affect your chances of finishing this little city here, but it's going to do that here anyway. Yep. Right? So if you're really worried about finishing that city, maybe go over here to get your one point. Leave no <coughs> openings anywhere. If you play a tile and you leave something like this on the board, whoever goes after you is going to get two extra points if they place a road there. Never, ever, ever put something on the table that someone else could get points from. Minimize the exposure everywhere. Every turn, when someone's turn starts, they should look at a board full of garbage. <laughs> right, look, there's also this awesome city tile hanging off the edge with the banner on it, right? It's like yeah. just giving that away, now you can put your people on that. Even better, leave no openings, pick up instant points. So, see how blue's on here? If you lay a tile, on a tile like this, that's a road and a road that are both end cap, you can score it immediately. So you literally play the tile, put the blue meeple on the completed road that you just completed, score it, take your two <coughs> points, and pick your meeple back up. Two points per tile ain't bad. So if you can do this, do it. Don't feel bad about it. Now we're talking about liberty. So I've got the city here. Nice little two points, two uh, tile city. It's worth four points if I finish it. There are a whole bunch of tiles that can be played to either finish the city or continue the city. So that's a lot great. of options. Which means the odds of you drawing one of those tiles to add to that city is good. Good chance. But there's some danger here. Uh, either of these tiles could be placed to reduce my liberties. If, if either one of these gets placed next to my city, then one of these edges loses a liberty. There is now a specific feature that has to be on the tile I use to continue building my city or to finish my city. So by putting tiles next to other people's features, you increase the complexity of what they need to do to finish them and decrease the likelihood that they will finish them. A good way to protect this is make long cities. Try to get the edges, the free edges of things you're building, away from other tiles. Because the longer you get, the harder it is to pull this nonsense. Whenever possible, hurt other people. The reality is, you don't get to play that many tiles, and it is way easier to screw someone else out of points than it is to get points for yourself. If I put a tile that denies Scott six points from a city, that is way better for me than getting measly two points. Right. Imagine if Blue finished this city. It would go from currently two points if he's stuck there at the game end, to two, four, six points if they just finish it with a little end cap, right? That's a difference of four points. Four points for one tile? Holy crap, because taking away four from the first place player is as good as getting four for you, because it's not about your, how many points you get, it's about being in first. And again, if you're playing this to hurt someone, then odds are less likely that they're gonna put a tile here. Don't put your meeple on the road, hang out somewhere else on the farm, or not at all. It's as often valuable to play a tile that hurts someone else, even if you don't score anything on it, because points taken away from anyone ranked higher than you are points for you. Even if you put no meeple on that tile, it's already a four point play. Already. A very effective strategy in base Carcassonne is to use these angle cities, of which there are many, to build these sort of closed structures that can be finished with all the tiles that are similar to each other. And the city, <coughs> look, there's no liberties to be hurt, and there's a lot of tiles that can fit up here. If I take the same two tiles and I rotate this one to make a line, now there's two different places that I can attack it from. Because I've made these adjacencies that make it easy to reduce liberty. <laughs> So that structure is very powerful. If you see another player doing that, try to build a tile up here to then get in and mess it up. 
And also, since four tiles are going to be placed between your current turn and your next turn if you're playing five player, well, <laughs> you'd be in trouble if they cooperate against you. Another very important heuristic for you is the idea of minimum tiles to completion. Any city you are in, you need to think about what is the minimum number of tiles it would take to finish and score that city. So with this city, the minimum is two. I can put one here, put one there. The easy way to count it is look for the number of edges on the city. The number of edges means number of things you have to cap off. And it gets a little complicated. So if I stick this guy here that has three edges, the minimum time to completion, or minimum tiles to completion, is actually only still two. Because a tile can go here that will cover two edges at once. But there is reduced liberty, there's less likelihood of getting that specific kind of tile. But if I get that tile, good times. Any tile that is, has this sort of like line arrangement, meaning it has two ends, maintains your minimum tiles to completion while just adding points. Even if you never finish it because they screw you over, adding that to your city just gives you two points because I got a banner on it, so why not? Yeah. It doesn't make it any harder for you to finish. It's a two-point play. Two-point play is pretty good. The nature of the game and the way rogues are structured because of just the way the tiles look, it is very likely that farms will be separated from other farms in ways that make it very difficult to connect them. So in general, you need to think about roads that curve inward that make closed loops tend to be more open to farming. They tend to make more things connect to the right. farm. Because the, the, the inside of the road is not a good farm, but the outside of the road, oh, that's a hella good farm, right? You know, the inside of the circle is this area, the outside is everywhere else. So if this was going straight and curving up this way, you'd see it cap the farm off. So look for closed tight loops and things like that. That is how to figure out what the big farms are gonna be. Cloisters <laughs> with roads on them are magic. They are one of the few ways to take a road which is going to separate these two farms and link them <laughs> together. It is very often useful if you can place this cloister tile with the road end on it at the end of a road and people aren't already farming, stick your farmer there. Forget those cloister points. Cloisters are not the way to win this game. They're just bonus points. Don't worry about that. Do this. Now you control both sides of this road. That is a big deal in this game. Right, in a cloister you think best case scenario is going to be nine points, right? A farm that has just three cities in it is nine points, right? So, mm -hmm. Because you might think, oh, I played this one <laughs> tile, it was nine points per tile. No, 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 you played that tile and you put one in the cloister, that is two points per tile to start. You only get more points if more tiles get placed here. Unless other players place tiles next to this cloister, you're only going to get another point for that tile if you take another tile and place it there, thus diluting your points per tile. You're going to have to place all your future turns, of which there aren't going to be many, around that cloister. So if some jerk places a cloister, don't put tiles next to it. If you got a tile and you can't use it and you got to dump it, don't stick it here. Look, there's only two places I can put this. I can put it here or I can put it here. You might as well put it here, because that way this does not have an extra, not only an extra tile that's worth more points connected to it, but it also caps off one of these ends. It decreases the minimum tiles to completion. If you stick it here, it has a minimum three tiles to completion, and it doesn't have an extra point. <coughs> I know we keep saying this, you will play a tile, and then a whole bunch of other people will play tiles. If someone else starts making a big city, a few of you just need to stop them from building it, and you're all good. Hurt other players. I keep saying it because it is way easier to do that than it is to get points. There is one thing against hurting other people, right? You got a mold, you got a more than two player game going on, right? You got me, Rim, and other person. If Rim is the one who spends his tile attacking other person, and I don't have to spend my tile attacking other person, that's good for me. Remember politics? That is politics. It's the balloon popping game. We play a game where everyone in this room has three balloons, and on your turn, you pick someone and pop one of their balloons. And we're literally voting on who wins the game. Political games are effectively vote who wins. Carcassonne is the same way. If I hurt Scott, I'm at minus one in some arbitrary metric because I wasted the tile to hurt Scott. And Scott's at minus one because I did an action to hurt him. If I hurt Scott and Scott hurts me and I hurt Scott and Scott hurts me, we have done the opposite of king making. We're like piss boy making. I don't know. Guillotine. We're just letting, we're making other, we're letting another person win. We're just giving them points. So convince other people to hurt people and get points for yourself. Like whenever possible, jump in on a city, steal points from other people, share the load. 
I moved a little quick here because I want to get into <coughs> the actual game. But there are tiles that will let you break these sheds. I don't so think that's going to be in that box. I, that think I think there's one of those in that really? box. Really? That'd be crazy. Here's a very interesting heuristic. This is why expansions are good. You get tiles like that. Try to predict where the farms are going to be. So remember how roads are worth one point per tile and cities are worth two points per tile? I remember how we also said you want to play a tile that scores immediately and pick your meeple right back up? City like that is worth four points. You can get four points by placing a tile like that there. So what tends to happen in base Carcassonne is that as soon as someone starts putting some small cities in the area, because the small city tiles have other small cities on them, all these small cities will cluster together. If a city is 20 tiles or two tiles, it's worth the same three farmer points. This is one baller farm. So get in early on farms that look like this kind of pattern is going to emerge. Also, there's a baller farm on the other side too, because yeah. city's got two sides. And look, this is very trivially connected in here. You want to use all your meeples all the time. But not right away. You, right? If you, you put all, how many meeples are you going to get? Six, maybe? I think so, I forget. Some number, right? If you just put all your meeples out on your first six turns, and you don't have any, the next tile you draw, you're going to have to put somewhere bad, and someone else is going to be able to capitalize on it and take points from it. So on your turn, you always want to have at least one meeple free, because you always want to have the ability to put that meeple out. So you, yep. if you put a meeple on a road, and you're starting to run low, Finish that road instead of starting a new one so you have a free meeple for the next turn. But at the same time, you don't want to have a whole bunch of meeples off the board because then those meeples aren't working and getting you points. So you want to get them all on the board, all working, but except one because they'll all be free. And then at the very end, ideally, you put your last meeple on the last turn to maximize the point, you know, because basically the meeples are like little point fountains. You want to get them all working, right? But always be able to, you know, move them around. So if you ever run out of meeples, or you have meeples left after your last turn, you did mess up. You messed something up at some point. There are very rare exceptions where <coughs> placing your last meeple on a thing are the right idea. I do not think you will run into those situations. If you think it's that situation, well, we'll talk. We got a, uh, our last slide. We got a last bit there. Yeah. Neither of these tiles are in the game. The witch hat and the inverse witch hat. Witch hat? Inverse witch hat. You'll find that the weird tiles in Carcassonne have names among people who play Carcassonne a lot. We made up those names. I've never heard anyone no, use them. No, Amber's friends made up those names. Okay, sure. They but said them, and we thought I've they were I've never heard anyone at PAX say them. No, so that was our group. But other groups have had similar names. Some of them are quite raunchy, and I'm not going to share them here, but they exist. <laughs> the point is, when you're playing the game, look at what kinds of tiles are really common, like road. Road that curves, city that that's, that's at an angle, and pay attention to what tiles are not common or are weird, like angle city with an angle road coming into it. There's only one of those jerks. These and are not in the game you're playing. These are not in the game. This is the only good expansion to Carcassonne. Inns and cathedrals. This is a must-have Carcassonne expansion. If you're serious about Carcassonne, you buy it, you love it, you play it a lot, get this expansion and only this expansion. It adds a bunch of tiles to the game, and it adds the inns and the cathedrals, which are actually both really terrific. Because we've basically taught you, other than some of the math, like literally nearly perfect play. Like, there is not much you can do other than the things we have said that can make you <coughs> better at a game where you at most have one-fifth of the actions in the game. If you add this expansion, all these do, really briefly, they're not in the game, if that's on a road, that road scores double, but only if it finishes. It's worth zero at the end of the game if you didn't finish it. This, an extra point per tile and an extra point per pennant in a city that finishes. And zero points if the city doesn't finish. Meaning, the vast majority of the time, this is placed in someone else's city to ensure they never finish it, and they get zero points. Oh, you're building a giant city? Let me put a little cathedral in there, and now the church takes all the points. Eh, if, done. if these tiles were in the tournament we're about to play, this talk we gave would literally have to have been twice as long to talk about the strategies. Right. Also, uh, the, uh... <laughs> yeah, what do you, what, what, what you, what you got? Yeah, I never mind. I completely forget. <laughs> <laughs> so remember we talked about hurt other players? In games, in general, you need to convince other people to do your dirty work oh, for you. I remember. So in games like uh, Chrononauts, anyone play Chrononauts? Okay, I'm not oh. gonna use the example then, but there's a good example from Chrononauts. 
in, in Civ 5, Civilization, if someone's going to win the game, <coughs> someone's running away with the game, and they're going to win like on their next turn, or they're going to score a big thing, don't do anything to stop them. Take your turn first, and then whoever goes after you, be like, Scott, if you don't play this tile, he's going to win the game. <laughs> Never volunteer to do this and never point it out until you already took your turn. I can't do anything. It's not my turn. And you have to do it before the game ends. Right. This is the advice part that we talked about, right? Where you should be giving advice. You have to show the tile before you put it so everyone can talk about it. That's when this part happens. Right? Also, don't be the last person to go before the person is winning so that way you're yep. not forced to do the thing. And luckily, you're already all seated. And I don't think... We'll see what happens when we actually start the games. But when you start to get good at these games, you'll find a very, many games for convenience just go clockwise. Play Harvest Zone doesn't matter too much, but other games matters a lot, the turn order. Big but time. it does matter in Carcassonne. We're getting to the point to where chair order, actually, like, that'll make the difference, like that 1% difference, when you're all playing perfectly. And then it's just random after that. So, El Grande, the big, which is in the classic tabletop area, you should play El Grande. It's a fantastic, fantastic game, and you're going to learn brutal... When we played this game, we would stand around the table... And I'd sit down. And I'd sit down over here. No, I don't think so. I'm going to get up and go to the other side the table. So we're pacing around the table for like five minutes, arguing about who's going to sit where, and then our friend was like, Jesus, really? All right, we're randomly determining a seat or sitting order for the rest of our lives now because you children can't just sit down and play a game. But then we randomized the seating order, like, well, I guess so-and-so wins. <laughs> it matters a lot in other games, and in Marcus Zone, <laughs> it matters. So, in general, in games that use this convenient clockwise thing, you want to go before people who are better than you and after people who suck. Because someone who sucks at Carcassonne is going to leave a nice fat city hanging off that you can just jump onto. Someone who sucks at Carcassonne is going to leave opportunities open. They're going to make poor decisions. Someone who's good is going to see what you're trying to do and hit you off. You want to go before the person who's good, not after. And last but not least, the easiest way to win this game is to cheat. And I just want to point out that that is actually one of the only rules of PAX. You can be kicked out of PAX for cheating. It's possible. That's I why I, I haven't PAX. seen it happen, but it can happen. I've never seen it happen. Don't cheat. Don't cheat. And I'm going to make one last uh, promise to you. Once we start the tournament, we're going to get these games out and start playing. At any point, if any one of you wants to make a deal with the devil, you can do this any time, you can do it as many times as you want. Raise your hand, one of us will come over, we'll look at the situation, we'll tell you exactly what we would do in your position, but we will explain why to everyone else at the table. <laughs> I have probably played Carcassonne hundreds of times. Too many, I can't even know how many times. Yeah, especially because the app, I play it when I'm pooping, so. AI's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not too bad. But I, I think I, I have like worse. a 70, 80% win rate among skilled players at base Carcassonne. Scott's also you don't, like, you don't lose too often. Scott's also like 60, 70%, so. Yeah. I promise the advice we give you will be good. And Why would we give you bad advice? We're not in the tournament. And if, if we come to the table and we give advice and someone disagrees and you're right, uh, I'll, I'll give you a prize of some kind. That would be amazing. The only prize we have is the... Is the uh, so, whatever. good luck, have fun. We're going to figure out how to make this tournament happen right now. Right. If you don't want to stick around for the tournament, I highly recommend you grab one of these because the videos of all those other talks we've given about other games or generic winning are on YouTube. If you don't, if you're going to stay, we will be happy to give these to you in the course of Carcassonne. All right, so we have, it looks like, <laughs> one, two, three, right, ten boxes of five players each. So we can have 50 people. We can have 50 people, so let's make ten tables of five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 